Okay, thank you everyone um, and welcome once more to uh, this webinar um, uh, hosted by the community-based HPSS uh, working group of uh, the inter and community reference group on MHPSS uh, settings. Uh, I'm going to get us started um, because we've got an hour and we've got uh, quite a lot to get through. And so I'm going to hand it to my colleague, uh, Guli, um, who will unmute uh, and, and take over from here uh, and introduce the, the webinar and, 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 the, and the working group. Uh, I would like to ask all of you, uh, if possible, to um, perhaps, it's, it's lovely to see you all, but given that some of our colleagues will be connecting from um, locations with quite poor video, um, uh, sort of, would it be possible if you just make sure that your sound is uh, but also that your video is off um, uh, for the duration of the webinar. We'll ask you to put it on at the end so that we can all see each other before we, we, we depart. But for now, um, just switch your video off uh, and we'll just have the presenters um, live. Uh, we, we reduce the bandwidth organization um, uh, for, for those who are connecting from poor bandwidth areas. So Guli, um, the, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ananda, and welcome everyone from all, uh, from all over the world. You know, we are seeing it. There is even someone from my born town in Sicily. So I, you know, I wonder if it's a relative or an actual, you know, an actual participant. But uh, so my name is Guglielmo Schinina, but everyone calls me Gulli in the humanitarian world. Uh, and I'm the head of uh, mental health, psychosocial response, and intercultural communication globally at the International Organization for Migration. I'm here uh, today representing the working group, the working group on uh, community-based approaches to mental health and psychosocial support of the Interagency Standing Committee. Uh, I will explain in a second how this group sits in the architecture of the Interagency Standing Committee. Next. Uh, so uh, this is a group, uh, this working group is part of the uh, Interagency Standing Committee Mental Health and Psychosocial Support Reference Group. This is a group that comprises more than 50 members uh, between uh, United Nations uh, non-governmental organization and governmental, uh, governmental organization, uh, but also academics and uh, group of interest that uh, um, encompass, uh, that, uh, let's say, whose main aim is, was originally to develop guidelines for the use of the field, and uh, from uh, 2007 on, when uh, it was, the guidelines were completed, it has been to uh, promote the use of the, guideline, the guidelines in the field, but also to um, mainstream uh, the guidelines and MHPSS across the uh, humanitarian response sectors. Uh, in 2016, um, we uh, funded, some of us, you know, uh, created a working group that is an integral part of the work of the reference group. So the reference group usually uh, work through working groups. And uh, uh, this was in 2016. So maybe we have to go one slide less, exactly. Why we did that? You know, we did that uh, one slide more, so next. Why we did that, you know? We did that to um, promote uh, mental health and psychosocial support that was centered on communities' own understanding of their own needs, resources, and conceptions of mental health and psychosocial support. As you probably know, MHPSS and mental health and psychosocial support is one of the most culturally bound domain of health and humanitarian action. So it was important to put communities at the center. We wanted also to complement a discourse that was increasingly centered at that period in time on individual support, one-on-one -on -one psychiatrical or psychological care. Uh, you might remember MHGAP, PM Plus, uh, Self Help Plus, all those were, um, were launched in that period. There is nothing wrong with those. They are necessary and essential to the MHPSS field. On the other side, we wanted to complement this discourse uh, through a community-based approach to look also at what is happening at the community level. And in particular, to recognize the importance of collecting wounds in determining also individual uh, mental health and psychosocial support needs, but also collective responses in miti mitigating those needs. Next. 
Um, in 2019, we published the, the work of this group that was uh, the community-based approaches to MHPSS programs, a guidance note. Uh, it was a collective work. You see in the slide uh, the several agencies that collaborated to the develop development of this guidance, which is a very short document, so it's not, uh, not a long document, that tried to uh, promote uh, community-based approaches throughout the MHPSS pyramid of intervention of the Interagency Standing Committee uh, reference group. The text was a collective writing and is quite short, so it's not a, a manual, it's not a handbook, it's really a guidance note with only essential point that then any agency can take on uh, in their own program. Next. Uh, currently, the working group is co-led by IOM, as I said, and UNICEF. I just saw that Anna Willowheit, you know, uh, just joined, uh, joined the meeting and she will uh, take on, you know, part of the presentation. And uh, um, thanks to the funding of uh, USAID, of the, in particular, of the USAID, is currently updating the IOM manual on community-based MHPSS in emergency and displacement, which is a tool that we developed for IOM, but is open source for everyone, that look at specific indication of programming on community-based approaches. Uh, UNICEF on its side is updating, updating the 20. 2015 compendium, compendium of community-based MHPSS resources. This is a participatory process that is ongoing in this moment in time, and we will have the results, uh, uh, I think, early next year. We are producing webinars and videos on community-based MHPSS best practices, and this is actually the first of a series, as Ananda will explain you uh, later on. So this is the first introductory webinar to a series of webinars, on which we will also ask you to contribute, as he will explain. And we are translating the guidance note, the community-based approaches to MHPSS programs guidance note, into five languages, as it will be explained uh, soon after. Um, this uh, is it from my side. I want just to go to the next slide to show that, uh, as I said, these are collective work, not only IOM and UNICEF, and these are all the agencies that have been actively uh, participating and supporting the work of the community-based MHPSS, uh, uh, community-based approaches to MHPSS programming group. This is everything from my side, and uh, I leave the word to Ananda. Thank you very much, Guli. Um, we thought that it might be uh, interesting to ask you also, especially considering the, the overwhelming interest that we have now 240 people in the room um, in this topic about you know, what brings you here today. And we'd like to invite you in, uh, in the chat box to share your thoughts on what the relevance of community-based MHPSS approaches are to the field. You heard some of Guli's um, uh, thinking uh, reflecting some of the impetus from the, uh, the, the working group uh, a couple of years ago, but we'd love to hear um, what your thoughts are uh, as well. And I'd, I invite you to, um, to uh, 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 put, uh, put your thoughts in the chat about what you think uh, the reasons for, uh, the reasons uh, community-based MHPSS approaches are relevant to and while you're doing that, I thought we, it would be nice to share with you um, some, um, some uh, videos that uh, colleagues from around the world uh, actually um, sent in to us um, in response to our query about what, why they thought community-based MHPSS approaches were relevant today. Uh, and some of the colleagues who contributed are in the room. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, this is why we asked you these questions over WhatsApp and email. I think that community-based mental health and support approaches are always relevant to the field because children We lost the sound, Ananda. Uh, cultural ways of relieving distress Hold on, did, did, when I muted, did you lose the sound? Sorry about yeah. that, let me, 
start again. Um, I was just didn't want to have background sound from my side. Let me let me start that again. Apologies. I think that community-based mental health and psychosocial support approaches are always relevant to the field because children, youth, the families and communities are at the forefront of raising and protecting children. So our role is to support them in this regard rather than substitute. They know best what type of psychosocial support they need. There are so many informal mechanisms that are in place at a community level. Mechanisms to support each other, cultural ways of relieving distress, we should always first strengthen what exists before proposing new types of support, as then you can increase the chances for this type of support to be culturally appropriate, to remain accessible, and of course, sustainable. Community-based MHPSS approach is even more relevant in the field at this time. As on one side, with the COVID-19 pandemic comes additional stress, anxiety about the disease, the lack of reliable information, the restriction of movement, the economical impact, and this affects all groups in your community, children, youth, parents, leaders. While on the other side, this comes with additional challenges for communities to access mental health and psychosocial services and service providers to access vulnerable communities. As we mentioned, access to information on the disease and the type of support that remains available for vulnerable uh, people is crucial and who know best how to convey information for vulnerable group within a community. The people themselves with them. More than ever, supporting and empowering communities to strengthen pre-existing types of support or develop culturally adapted innovative ways to support each other and develop and disseminate appropriate information is essential. Empowering communities support them feeling worthy, feeling respected, having a role to protect themselves, and this in turn supports the psychosocial resilience. However, as development and humanitarian workers, we should also be mindful that despite access, vulnerable communities need ongoing support and resources to adapt and continue their action towards supporting mental health and psychosocial well-being of the communities. COVID-19 pandemic forced us to rely much we need to continue moving towards with supporting community-led initiated work. The community-based MSPSS approaches are important because they strengthen community system, build social cohesion, identify drivers of conflict and social tension, reinforce positive cultural practices, and redefine harmful practices. They also identify problems and address such problems through culturally relevant interventions. While such community-based MSPSS approaches are even more relevant at the time of COVID-19. In my opinion, it is because due to the COVID-19, the way we did our business has changed dramatically. Our houses have become places for adults and schools for children. Our community buildings have become hospitals, isolation centers, and places for quarantine. The older generation, the working parents and young children are all at home and in the community. This new situation has created a new individual and social behavior where individuals have to define their new social rule of interaction with the within the parameter of new normal. The use of community-based MSPSS approaches in the new normal era will help individuals, families, and communities to support each other and promote and, and resiliency. As approaches view COVID-19 COVID affected people as active stakeholders capable of making positive changes despite the difficult situation they are in. And I think the community-based MSPSS approaches are important because they help in defining individual and group identity, creating the sense of belonging, and the support people in acquiring coping strategies to deal with adversity. Thank you. Thank you.
peoples, the second from the families and the third from the communities. Good science support has to be built on the existing levels of crisis management. The work on community-based mental health and psychosocial support assessment is not just very important, but given the present challenges of the pandemic, it is relevant as well. Engaging a community to change practices and supporting them to deal with isolation, loss of livelihood, loss of loved ones, and the fear of death have been uh, some of the greatest mental health and psychosocial challenges in recent times. If a community believes that the virus is part of a conspiracy uh, to harm their uh, beliefs and um, the safety instructions by the state are also part of the conspiracy, then they are unlikely to follow those and might resist implementation. This happened in multiple communities in Pakistan and led to many debates, including one about um, implementing SOP in the mosques to prevent infection. Now, instead of enforcing a complete shutdown of mosques, these communities and the ulema were consulted. They agreed to observe strict uh, SOPs to allow only a few people to offer any. Now, this solution respected the religious and cultural sensitivities. Uh, this was generated through community participation. It addressed widespread distress without causing any further harm. Um, so this is a good example of community-based mental health and psychosocial support initiative. Uh, hi, my name is Patrick Nyango Manget, um, and uh, I've been working in the field of community mental health for over 25 years. I think the community mental health approach is still relevant in today's time because the rationale uh, that we based on to to community mental health work is still relevant, uh, and that rationale uh, likely entailed congesting health centers by taking the services out of communities and families. In present time, there are movement restrictions. Um, service users are not able to reach out to the facilities because that would be other, the other alternative to community mental health. The alternative would be uh, to focus on facility-based treatment. Uh, but that is not uh, possible now, nor is it, uh, the most, would it be the most appropriate way of increasing access to, to service. Uh, moreover, the, 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 the levels of depression and stress um, during this pandemic are really high. And so there are many people out there who are first time users of the service. They don't know where to access the service from and they have never accessed the service. So these are the ones who, that would uh, benefit this um, approach. The, the other I should is um, over 20 years ago when we started doing community mental health, um, there was a large number of health workers that were not familiar with mental health work. So we had to do quite a lot of training um, in mental health orientation, um, in identifying cases, and in case management. But the, the numbers of clinicians that are specialized mental health clinicians has always been limited. And so with these limitations of professional uh, staff, uh, trained clinicians in mental health, what is the alternative? Community mental health allows you to do things uh, that prevent uh, mental health problems from escalating. You would be working with families, you would be understanding this, the stressors that families are exposed to, the levels of vulnerability, uh, and you will take time to really understand how families are coping with this, these mental illnesses uh, and these difficulties within the family setting. So the, the approach, community mental health approach, uh, allows us to learn, to learn and understand in what context are these symptoms and mental illnesses manifesting within the community and what resources um, do the communities have available to respond and deal with these issues. The reason I think the community-based MHPS approaches are of much relevance uh, in the crisis context, and especially at this time, uh, first, from the knowledge and understanding of MHPS on the impact of uh, social factors or social connections to well-being. 
um, the communities that we are supporting since as an active communities that hear their opinions and they also have the capacity to involve in the decision making process. That's also the reason why engaging communities and enhancing community participations are an entry point in our planning, implementing and evaluating the image basis activities. Uh, the second reason is in any of human responses, we acknowledge that our accountability is to all layers of stakeholders, in particular to itself, uh, in which we need to ensure that we are applying the basic principle, including the do no harm principle. The third reason is on the relevant aspect of our focus on the programming to ensure that there's an inclusion and empowerment by involving the communities in all layers of MH basis intervention. Um, thanks to the, um, the uh, uh, colleagues uh, who, um, who recorded that for us, uh, those of you who are in the room especially. Um, I'd, uh, I'd like to just pull out a few of the, the themes that emerged for me from, from some of what they, what they said. Um, there, was, there was a lot about the, the relevance, um, the idea that uh, individuals, families and communities are already at the forefront of response to crisis uh, and, and that they are the ones who know best what they need or what is appropriate and, and are ideally placed to, to guide the interventions. Uh, on the other hand, we also heard arguments for the fact that um, that other approaches that perhaps depend on depend on clinicians or trained staff just don't have the personnel and the resource, human resources um, to to meet the needs, and that a lot of prevention and promotion work can be done through families and communities, and, and that perhaps they're also useful entry point um, for formal services. Um, we did hear. Uh, also about the fact that you know we need to build on what's there, empower communities, mobilize the resources that they, they already have and give them a, a role and support them as they continue to play the role under difficult circumstances. Um, and also I think Navaraj mentioned you know the fact that you could reinforce positives and also somehow through engagement in these uh, approaches kind of address some harmful community practices that may hinder people's well-being. Um, and he talked also about broader concepts of, of social cohesion. And, and of course, multiple um, colleagues mentioned uh, that the context we're in right now, COVID-19, uh, the nature of the pandemic and its consequences for, for, the, for societal and community impacts. Uh, and also just the fact that communities have become the places of work. We're all at home and, and community. Uh, and, and this is now, what us in a sense, a, a new set of opportunities. Um, uh, so I'd, I'd love to hear um, what Guli and Jen also think about um, some of the comments that were made uh, in the chat um, um, dur during the during the video. Um, Guli and um, invite you to unmute and, and share some of your thoughts. Sure, I was uh, following uh, the chat, you know, as much as I could, you know, while uh, the presentation were ongoing. And I was um, speaking, first of all, by the level of participation. You know, people are discussing a lot, you know, over the chat. And uh, by three main points, you know, uh, there was a strong argument that the community-based approach demystify the idea that communities are only victims, let's say, or people with, the, with the psychological problems. But also, and I think that's most important, that the mental health is not only for those who have severe mental disorder or mental disorders. You know, mental health is something, a much broader concept, you know, something that invests all the, the aspects of community life. But I really liked this point. You know. um, then there is another point that I think is true, on which I have already a small issue. So they, someone is saying that uh, community-based means culturally adapted. Uh, I don't believe that's entirely you not know, true, in the sense that cultural adaptation means uh, somehow making the community digest uh, constructs and concepts that you develop somewhere else. You know? I think a real community-based approach will be the one that bring together the communities from the very beginning in developing and understanding what are their own ways of responding, but also in uh, developing context-specific you know, uh, materials. Uh, finally, um, uh, there is uh, also, there was another issue that I think was uh, in, important, that they say community-based approach 
grant more access to services, you know, because when you have a, an environment that is uh, conducive, people will go more to, uh, not to specialize in quality services. That's true, but also the bet is that the community-based approach actually will decrease the number of people who will be in need of specialized services, because uh, a nurturing community uh, is usually one of the best responses to, to several issues. Um, one issue that was raised and I think you know, can be discussed really you know, in the group but also in further, in further webinars that is extremely important is the issue of time. Uh, so how to uh, grant a real community-based approach with the time that very often we have available it is a very short time project program time. And probably I would add to that also the issue of power, you know, how can we really uh, allow a community-based approach uh, with the, uh, which uh, basically go against the, uh, the power structure that humanitarian intervention anyhow need to create in order to be effective sometimes. And that's my, my, Thanks, my, I, my provocative I, question. I, I'm glad also that you took issue with it because I think complicating these, uh, well, community-based uh, approaches are complex and involve um, I think a diversity of, of, of points of departure also. And I think that that is exactly what we want to see in the dialogues uh, that we hope to uh, facilitate going forward. So thank you so much for that. And do you want to jump in with any, any additional thoughts? Sure. Hi. Um, yeah. So uh, just a few thoughts. I think one person in the chat mentioned that it leaves tools for a long time to come after afterwards if the community is properly engaged. And one thing that stood out to me from the speakers in the video was that all of them referenced COVID because um, obviously we're in the middle of a pandemic. And I think community responses uh, as a part of pandemic response and thinking about how the long term uh, tools will be there and engagement might be there and ownership might be there are especially important right now. Um, uh, because the coronavirus response is affecting every single aspect of the community and so our response must be very intersectional. Um, so we're thinking about how all of these different factors and structural factors of uh, you know economic factors and social factors and educational factors and protection factors are all working together to impact uh, mental health right now and this is definitely at a community level and so I just thought that was an interesting thought that community approaches must be there especially for the longer term uh, coronavirus response on, on a multi-sectoral and intersectional level. Thanks. I'm going to cut in here um, and ask you Anne to introduce yourself and also to introduce the, um, the, the guidance note uh, if you might. Um, just uh, just keeping it on the clock. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so hi everyone. Uh, sorry for just speaking without you know who I, knowing who I am. Um, I am Anne Wilhoit. I am a MHPSS specialist with UNICEF and I co-lead the IASC community-based uh, mental health working group with GULI uh, on behalf of UNICEF. So I'm just going to take you all through the guidance note uh, launched earlier this year. Hopefully many of you have already read it. Uh, and so as I'm going through the different aspects, if you have things to add in the chat, uh, something that is relevant about the things that I'm uh, talking through of the note or experiences you have about those particular aspects, um, that would be great. And just as a reminder, if everyone can mute yourselves, um, that would be wonderful. All right, let's go. Um, so, as you have gathered, a uh, primary point of a lot of the community-based approaches is about community participation. Um, so, it recognizes, recognizes that communities need to be meaningfully involved in all stages of the MHPSS response. So, this, we, we will sprinkle in the word meaningful throughout here, and what we're really saying there is that uh, participation is just not a uh, token. We're not saying, oh yeah, well, let's make sure we get a representative from so-and-so so we can say that they were a part of it and so we can look good. Uh, we're saying, okay, let's really make sure we're getting the feedback from the community and the power is with them. Um, so in the whole guidance note, we follow the phases. Um, there we go. So first, uh, and I'll take you through them, but uh, assessment, planning, 
startup and implementation and evaluation. Um, so we'll go through the different aspects of each. Okay, so the assessment phase. So here we're thinking, okay, what are the needs of the community? Um, this should definitely be participatory. We were talking about it being meaningful, but uh, from aspects of gender and age uh, and the context, making sure that all things that may not be listed of who should be participating, but in your community, where are all the marginalized populations that maybe should be participating? What are the re relevant con cultural contexts and contextual situations to make sure that all of those people are at the table. We want to make sure that we're not just identifying the problems. Uh, Western psychology definitely has a reputation for being very problem focused and here we want to flip that uh, entirely and make sure that we're identifying the resources and the strengths and yes also the risks to make sure that we're doing due diligence um, but making sure that all are equally considered. And then sharing back the assessment results. Uh, our programs are not there to just come in and uh, take information away. Uh, we're sharing what came of those assessment results with the community and making sure that everyone is equally a part of understanding where things are at. Next slide. And then planning. So now that we've decided and figured out uh, what, the prior what the needs are in the community, now we're gonna prioritize. So we've gone through the problems and the needs, and so we're gonna see what the community thinks about what the most important aspects are of those that need to be addressed. And then jointly identify together how they would know if it's been accomplished. Uh, what would they be able to see in the community or understand about the community to know that they have uh, successfully done their programming? So jointly identifying what those indicators are, what the, what, how they would know it's being accomplished. And then avoiding fragmentation, making sure we're referring, as we talk about a lot in the 2007 guidance, uh, making sure there aren't parallel systems, that there aren't different pieces happening, and that we're coordinating together with all of the relevant parties. Then from uh, implementing, so, uh, mobilizing resources is important, uh, but making sure the community is involved in that as well. It's not just a donor coming in telling people what to do, but the community deciding how to get the money, how it goes about, and if there are other things that can complement perhaps donor funding as well. Um, mobilizing the community and strengthening the existing infrastructure that's already there, that people already have the leadership and the strengths and the potential to engage and provide uh, the intervention or the activities, uh, provide information along the way. It's not something that is strange or unusual if you know what it is. And so making sure that everybody's on board and understands the intention and what's gonna happen and what's gonna happen at the end. Um, we've been talking a lot about uh, meaningful participation, participation, especially by marginalized people uh, who may not be the first people to the table and let their voices be heard, figuring out ways uh, we often, Sometimes people come and say, well, we need to identify the champions or the leaders in the community, and we do, but we also need to identify the people whose voices are not being heard. Um, and that takes much more time and resources, so planning for that as well and making sure you understand how to involve marginalized populations. Um, and then monitoring, collecting uh, feedback and adjusting the services. I'm gonna go into this more because the next next page is about uh, our evaluation but making sure that evaluation is not just happening at the end and you figure out how it went and then you're done but rather all the way through with the community saying how is this going identifying where you're at at those indicators you previously identified that the community agreed on and then telling everyone how you're doing how you might adjust it to better achieve those indicators and then continue on in a modified version to do better And then finally, evaluation. Um, so like I said, this doesn't just happen at the very end, but usually a larger evaluation does happen at the very end and making sure that that's with the community as well. 
discussing that. This is not a hidden report to just be sent to a donor on the side. This is something that the community comes up with together. You discuss where it was at, what the outcomes were, and then again, readjusting what was happening uh, with your goals and your activities to make sure that it really is going in the direction you wanna go. And this is where someone had a comment in the chat earlier about uh, how this can, uh, community approaches can make things more sustainable and I think this is a really good reason why is that you're looking towards okay how can we constantly be adjusting and you're including the whole community in that problem solving um, and making a part of their own work going forward um, to readjust the goals and activities. Something that often comes up um, and usually is dealt with at a, a community level is managing ethical dilemmas. And if any of you have any interesting things to share in the chat as we're going, please feel free. Um, I think this is often one of the most important things about implementing in a community. Um, so I think the overarching principle is our bottom left box there, doing no harm. Uh, no matter what, we wanna make sure we're balancing all of these things to not cause harm for the community. The challenge is that sometimes what's good for one section of the community might be causing harm for another part uh, and vice versa. So how do we constantly hold that tension and make sure we're not doing harm for all parties while continuing forward in a healthy way with um, the objectives? So first of all, balancing the need for a really comprehensive and detailed assessment uh, with the other side of the coin being the need for rapid action. And I think especially in emergencies we've seen this or when there's a lot of tension in the community, we wanna know really what's going on, but at the same time, if we spend too much time answering the questions, we can't get to work. Um, so making sure there's balance there. Uh, avoiding uh, exacerbating, uh, marginalizing or discriminating uh, against certain populations. Um, I, lots of people have probably seen this setting up a tent with a sign saying, uh, please, these people come here. And then everyone sees those people come there and says, oh, what's wrong with those people? And so we wanna make sure that we uh, are reinforcing positive inclusion and not singling out any individuals, uh, as especially ones that may be stigmatized. And then respecting traditions and promoting change. I noticed one of the speakers uh, on one of the videos said, you know, we need to promote uh, or, or watch out for harmful practices and promote positive practices. And so there's a way to do that while respecting the traditions and identifying those traditions that really are really positive for the community and supportive and helpful for the community and perhaps promoting change where there have been conflicts or challenges before, especially around some of those indicators that were previously identified. Okay. Um, so overall, uh, the overarching theme of everything we've been saying is that uh, community-based MHPSS approaches put the individual and the communities and the social systems at the very center of everything we're doing. So the intervention in terms of the planning, the assessment, the planning, the implementation, and the evaluation, uh, every single phase of the response. So we look forward to hearing more from you in the chat, uh, and I know that things have been popping up as I've been talking, uh, so we'll see if we are able to address some of these as we go, but we appreciate your thinking through all of this with us. Thank you. Oh, I have more. Yes, let me tell you about these wonderful things. This is the promotional part. Um, so we, this, this little thing you can copy and paste here uh, into your browser, and that's the guidance note. Uh, you can find the actual PDF version there. And most excitingly, drum roll, we have new versions that have been translated in five languages, which are, here we go, um, into Arabic, French, Portuguese, Spanish, and Urdu. So I think you can get all of those at the previous link as well, which is very exciting. And maybe someone just put them ah, yeah, in the chat. Um, so these are the ones that we have done for now. Um, thanks to our donor and we look forward to anyone else who might want to translate versions as well. It would be great to get this into as many languages as we can given it is a community level uh, approaches. So thank you very much. Thanks very much.
Anne, and thanks also to our colleagues who, um, uh, many of whom who worked on the translations and uh, in some cases did multiple rounds of checking and rechecking because um, some of the concepts we take for granted uh, in English do not appear as easily in other languages. So, um, all the links to the um, translations are in the chat. Um, um, a colleague has also just shared a, a short video that we've made that, that provides an overview uh, of the guidance note as well in case um, you'd like to um, share that with colleagues uh, going forward. Yes, thanks there. Um, so um, the, the title of this, um, of this session really is, is about launching a conversation. Um, so I've noted that there have been a number of really important uh, points being made in the chat uh, and uh, uh, some quite, in, in, oops, I need to get this thing under control. Uh, hold on one second. Um, so um, so um, essentially, um, what we've had is uh, we've had these. We've, I think we've already started the conversation, but I think in in some ways um, a webinar with you know um, 240, 230 people um, for a conversation may not always be an easy thing to manage. So what we've decided to do is is design a couple of online exchanges that uh, hopefully will will give us all space, not just to hear from a few people, but also for all of us to participate, not just on chat, but perhaps um, in, in, uh, in kind of uh, conversation with one another. Um, and and we, we're hoping to have two um, sessions before the end of the year. One is on um, focusing on implementation issues uh, and sharing insights and, and challenges from the field um, where uh, which will be on the 24th of November, and then one that focuses more on issues of assessment, monitoring, and evaluation um, in, in these community-based uh, approaches on the 8th of December. And the question of how those conversations are going to go is, is largely uh, up to, uh, well, up to us, but also up to you. Um, and we, uh, I shared with you a link at the start of the uh, of the the, uh, the webinar while we were waiting um, to, a, to a short survey where we're asking about um, some of the top challenges uh, that you identify relating to implementation of uh, community-based approaches or in relation to assessment, monitoring, and evaluation uh, of community-based approaches. Um, and, we, and also in that survey, there's also uh, uh, questions around um, some of the key resources or good practice examples uh, or articles, publications, uh, manuals, et cetera, that you would recommend to colleagues. Um, and I would really, really appreciate if you would be able to share some of that. We, we hope over the next of November and December that allow for some of these um, issues and the common issues to be addressed. And as I said, for us to interact with each other uh, and have, a, have conversations that have the type of complexity that uh, was hinted at with, with um, you know, Guli's, uh, Guli's response to some of the comments and some of the, the really um, insightful and, and challenging um, questions that were raised and noticed about you know, the, the nature, for example, of how funding structures uh, and processes um, impact on the ability to be truly um, uh, Community um, led um, in terms of our inter interventions and in our work. Um, so, I really uh, ask you all to, um, to fill out the, um, the survey, the link there, and the, the link has been also posted in the chat. Um, uh, we will also send it to you by email now that you've registered for this webinar. Um, and what we'd like you to do is also um, join us uh, at this um, group that we've just set up on. Um, on uh, mhpss.net where we will be uploading and we'd invite you to upload and share resources related to community-based mhpss at the moment it's it's uh, it's just got the six resources that we shared today um, but we're hoping that in the next uh, days and weeks um, we're going to multiply that many fold um, so this is the place to connect for conversation, for engagement around community-based MHPSS going forward um, with, with, the, with, the, um, uh, with this conversation that we're hoping to launch. Um, I know that we've got just a few minutes left, um, so I'd like to um, invite you to um, 
share any questions or comments in the chat box. Uh, and I'd like to ask uh, Guli and Anne to join me in responding to some of these. Uh, and of course, those of you who are uh, on, the, on, the, uh, um, on the webinar as well to, to respond in the chat. Um, so any uh, comments or questions about how we take this, uh, this conversation forward um, and, uh, and your, any other thoughts um, arising from, from the session we've had today? And while you're waiting, um, I might also ask our colleagues to share a short exit survey that, um, that we'd like you to take before you leave um, the room. Thanks, Kathleen. We're going to be um, saving all your comments uh, and, and um, and uh, using them as a as, and, uh, and the comments in, in, to our today to to shape the um, uh, the conversation going forward and the two events that we have planned. Um, if you have any specific ideas or, or, or um, resources that you'd like to share, we also really encourage you to um, just upload them to the uh, uh, to the, the the group on mhpss.net, and um, and we'll we'll be able to respond to you there. And hopefully all of us will be able to respond, yes. Ananda, there was this interesting point, I think, you know, on uh, um, urban and rural. Um, there's a suggestion, sorry. That, that's, that's a great question. It's the sort of question that I think that we could, we, we really ought to be able to um, address in one of these sessions where we're talking about, um, you know, uh, where the applicability of these approaches across different, I remember meeting at one point a, uh, a former um, uh, UN um, uh, uh, worker who who'd worked in uh, developing countries all his life, moved back to Hungary and started applying um, these approaches in, in the context of uh, uh, a European urban setting um, with, uh, with Roma communities. And uh, it's quite, quite, remarkable sort of um, application of that work and I think you got the good livelihoods award for that. Um, but I think we could certainly, uh, Frederica is suggesting that we can publish the comments anonymously with the video of the webinar. Um, certainly I think what we've also asked for people uh, permission in the, in the um, survey is that if they give us the permission to also even just be identified by their first name and their location because we'd like to not only have limit our engagement to the webinars or the, the online exchange sets, sets we're having, but also perhaps to um, maybe other online communities where we can have some bits of chat um, uh, uh, ongoing in between these events and beyond them, um, where we can stimulate uh, exchanges uh, amongst colleagues. I found another interesting point, you know, uh, someone is asking, uh, how do you, how can you really work on community-based approaches when you work in uh, closed camps, you know, and closed camps, I think we can enlarge the concept to reception centers or, you know, transit center where then people stay, you know, for years and years and, and things of the sort. And that's really challenging, you know, because uh, there, uh, the community is an artificial one in the sense that, you know, are people that uh, are in a way um, forced you know, to live together in the same space and time, you know? And so what do you want to do out of it? That's a very, very interesting, I think, you know, topic and, uh, and issue. So not only urban, rural, but also spaces of vulnerability versus communities. I suspect that if we have a breakout session on that, I know where you'll be, um, Guli. Um, <laughs> but I, I think also what's crucial to that, that kind of setting is also the question of power. And, and the amount of agency that people have within such settings. But, but I've also seen in some ways some quite interesting, um, actually community-led initiatives, nobody extended it, from within quite constrained camp conditions as well. So, um, so I, think, I think that would be a fascinating discussion, yes. Uh, 
Um, Someone also mentioned just uh, plain old logistics when when it, communities are really hard to get to, hard to access. Uh, that that's a huge challenge, and I think especially in uh, coronavirus times, uh, this is an even bigger challenge uh, when communities are entirely shut down or hard to get to. Um, and I think that this brings in also the digital divide question, where some some adaptations are really using social media and other sorts of things that require online access and that's just really not possible in so many of the remote communities uh, that we are trying to access for community participation so I, yeah, I, I, yeah i think it's interesting there's a there's it's not from the chat but i it was re recollecting a uh, something that that uh, stayed with me for decades i think uh, of a colleague who was working in the context of a, of a chronic um, civil conflict um, with multiple armed actors from within the community who came back one day and said, where is the community? I can't find it. And it was about the fact that uh, to be a leader, to be organized in certain ways, um, was to essentially put yourself at risk. So some of the standard operating procedures for, um, for um, uh, NGOs at the time uh, responding uh, just didn't work because people didn't want to be organized or engaged with through the same uh, were not available were not visible were not were not responsive um, in that in in that kind of um, setting um, so the the approaches had to be adapted very much uh, and and the conventional community based models didn't work at all I think there are two other very important points that are made in the chat now. You know, one is about adaptability. So one, one question was, okay, community-based approach is nice, but communities are uh, so many, you know, and uh, they differ, you know, from location to location, from emergency to emergency. So how can you make sure that you can uh, have a model that fits all? And I think, you know, the response to that, but obviously that's just a question we are not going to respond now is probably to look at the tools in terms of process, not outcome. So basically, you, know, you can establish processes so that you are able to gather communities' opinion or communities' participation, regardless of the community in which you are. You know? And then this process will have to become consistent with the local reality. But it's not tools, you know, that will be processes. And, uh, and then you know, there is uh, uh, another one, I think, about the connection with this building. And that's extremely important as well. I think it's crucial actually to our discourse because honestly, uh, the psychosocial field uh, was born out of that. You know? So now we talk about mental health and psychosocial support as a unicum, but if you look at it historically, uh, there was mental health that was you know, more clinical work that was done you know, at a certain point and mental health in humanitarian setting. I mean. And then the psychosocial work that was really revolving around community empowerment and peace building you know, in a way. I think it also raises the question of what is it that we can learn from other fields, um, because it looks like um, it's it's there. There are many of the principles and many of the insights and the kind of uh, complexities that have to be navigated are ones that, um, well, other fields do it well now. In some ways, I think that um, MHPSS as a field before, before it was MHPSS in the 90s uh, and early 2000s, there was a lot of focus on community-based work, which has sort of faded from memory. And there are some quite interesting um, examples of, of methodologies and of uh, kind of approaches that uh, I think are worth uh, you know, re-examining, resurrecting, um, using inspiration. Um, so I would like to continue this. I mean, there's a lot of really great commentary in the chat, but I'm also aware that people will have to leave because we are, we've hit the, the one hour mark. Um, I would like to invite everyone, um, thank you for your time. I would like to invite you all to switch your videos on so that we can see one another, uh, just to say goodbye, because, um, uh, so good to see all of you. Um, there's, there's multiple pages I have to go through now to see everyone because it's such a uh, such a full. Uh, great, great to see you all, <laughs> old friends and new. Um, um, I, I hope that this is just the beginning of of this conversation. Um, 
I, I, I do feel like many of you have said in the chat and our colleagues on the video uh, mentioned that, you know, the, you know, this is really the time that uh, community-based MHPSS is, uh, is, is making its comeback as it were. Um, right, it's relevant uh, it's because of the time, but also because of um, what we are understanding in terms of um, the gaps in, in some of the programming uh, approaches and what they can offer in the field. And we need uh, that diversity um, more than ever, I think, um, particularly in these, uh, these challenging times. So I'd just like to, uh, on behalf of my colleagues uh, um, and the, the community-based uh, MHPSS um, working group of the ISC reference group. Thank you so much for your time today and for all your inputs. Uh, we will be working with those as our primary basis for designing the forthcoming. Please join the group on mhpss.net. Um, take a look at the video we shared. Take a look at the resources we've shared. Um, share whatever you've got and, and, and your thoughts um, through, the, through the link, uh, the, the survey that we shared and also through the group. And we look forward to seeing you at least on the 24th um, of, was it the 28th? 24th of November. Um, and uh, uh, next, if not sooner, online. So thanks again.